Hello and welcome to Viewfield Baptist Church. My name is Stuart Weir. I'm National Director of Care for Scotland. It's a real joy to be able to share with you in this pre-record uh, that you'll be watching online uh, or on a screen somewhere this Sunday or some point this coming week. It's a real joy to be able to share with you and to come uh, and contribute to your community of faith. One very um, personally, uh, it's just a real joy as a friend of Ray's uh, to be able to just contribute for a day and, and to share. Uh, thank you, Ray. It's great to be able to come alongside uh, God's people in Dunfermline and um, and share in this way uh, the work that we're doing and to see if that is something that might flange with you, might be of interest to you, that you might wish to partner with going forward. Um, it's also a real joy because a uh, family of mine from the past, David and Helen Main, Caroline and Lorna, are my uncle and auntie and cousins. Uh, some of you who've been around the church for a while may know them. Uh, and so there's a little bit of a personal connection there too. So um, thank you for allowing me to join. Uh, I want to share uh, from scripture with you this morning. And so I'm just going to share my screen with you. Uh, from a an interesting text that I, I hope that uh, will strike a chord with you as uh, we think about what scripture might have to say about how we engage with politics and why, more to the point, probably more the why uh, today. Let's read from this really brief text. Peter and John had come along to the temple, had seen a lame man, and in the power of Jesus, seen this guy healed, um, and people are going mad, going, can you believe this is this lame guy? Incredible. What's going on here? They've just been to temple for prayers. Jerusalem's in a furore, but a positive one, trying to make sense of this transformation of this chap. And Peter starts speaking to the crowd. And as part of that response, fair way through his response to the crowd. Uh, do you think that we did this with our own power, et cetera, et cetera? He says to them, to the Jews, to his fellow Jews, you killed the author of life whom God has raised from the dead. And I don't know about you, but it's, it struck me when I reread this a few months ago. I was like, wow, Jesus as the author of life, do we really consider him with that title. Jesus has many titles, son of man, son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, king of kings, lord of lords, and they are all right and true and, and, and befitting of him. But how often do we think of Jesus as the author of life? Just a, an incredible title. And this, this phrase kind of evokes um, interesting images about Jesus himself as an author. It kind of draws our mind back into kind of the Old Testament at times when we think about um, in your book were written all the days that were formed for me, Psalm 139. The fact that he is an author and he writes us into his script. This whole concept of life comes from him and then if we stretch our our minds into the future uh, revelation 20 verse 12 we hear about the, the books were opened and also another book was opened the book of life and so this author is bringing life writing life into being creating life writing us into his story of creation the God who is both creator, sustainer, and redeemer, and ultimately who will be glorified and transform all things in an incredible way. We are the characters in his script. We are meant to perform and uh, engage in the story and in the cadence of his music in a way that um, is befitting of him as his creatures, as his friends. And so the, the Jesus of the Gospels is the very creator of the world. He brought um, 
everything that exists into existence out of nothing uh, in his authorship. We think as well as we think of the Gospels, his command of the wind and the waves uh, and the awe that that evoked from the disciples in the boat who'd momentarily before been utterly terrified for fear that their lives would, would be over there and then. The cursing of the fig tree and in that moment, the fig tree uh, obeys his curse. And of course, same God, Jesus himself with the Father and the Son, parting the Red Sea, standing the sea up like walls. Um, this is this same Jesus, the author of all created life. And so he is that God. The one who spoke life into being uh, using words. Um, in the beginning was the word, that's him himself, but he spoke words as the word into being. Uh, he, he brought life, he brought, he brought um, day and night and, and plants and animals and seas and land. And, uh, and we read that in Genesis 1 and 2 created existence never before in existence um, you know it, it was his very desire to bring the universe into reality um, his brainwave in his innovation you see jesus as author of life is the exemplar of instituting new wonderful things Hebrews, at the beginning of that letter, it says, Jesus created the worlds and sustains all things, all things by his powerful word, because he is the heir of all things. And that's just an incredible, uh, another place we can go to, to just reiterate the point that he is the one who is crafting this thing, not just at the beginning, but is reacting to what his creatures are doing and writing us into his story, responding to our responses, good, bad, or indifferent. And thus it is why Jesus, when he's raised from the dead, just recently we've been uh, feasting and celebrating over the fact that he has come back from death, from a horrific execution, um, that he has authority over what? Heaven and earth, all things, everything that exists, that has been brought into being outside of him, meaning apart from him, because he has always existed. That's why he has authority over heaven and earth. Not only is it he is creator, he, it's designer. He has authority over it because he is redeeming it through his death and resurrection. And so this author of life um, speaks of his immense power despite his humility, despite how he looks, despite the fact He's also human as well as divine. Um, remember, he's not ceased to be human, uh, forever transfigured uh, as a human being in combination with his divinity, even now praying, interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. Uh, unbelievable. He is, despite all his humility, I say despite, is a wondrous thing, um, is the author of all life. And so this speaking of life into creation, this um, this what the wonder of who he is, what he has uh, brought into being, um, sort of gives us a reverence and an awe uh, that we must uh, take stock for a moment and really just ponder His, his mastery, the fact that he is master, the fact that he's the one with the pencil, 
and not us. We are the words on the page. That gives us reason to afresh come to terms with the incredible nature of who he is, that people knelt down in front of him and felt unworthy, even though he brought them back up off their knees and made friends with them. It should evoke that response from us. And of course, um, he was the bringer of life as its author. I don't know if you know this picture. This is a picture by the Glaswegian uh, artist, Peter Housen. And this is this uh, depicts Legion being delivered from the demons. He was an exorciser of demons, bringing shalom, peace, and harmony. Uh, harmony between humans and the Father, harmony between humans and our fellow humans, harmony with the rest of creation. Uh, I, animals, plants, land, seas, air, and harmony with oneself. You know, Jesus brought life where there was deadening stillness and, and imprisonment. You think of how um, the religious leaders of the day had made a prison out of the Torah, out of the Jewish law, out of, of what we know as the Old Testament. And Jesus unlocked it and showed an interpretation of it that breathed life. Reading by the Spirit, seeing all the signposts, the scarlet thread the whole way through. We see that in the Road to Emmaus resurrection story where he had to go, have you not been reading the texts? Let me just show you how this should be read. And yet it had not been told that way. He brought life back to the story, enabled them to read it afresh as the bringer of life. He showed the ways of the kingdom of heaven. Um, forgiveness, incredible, relentless, ongoing, almost um, dogged and persistent forgiveness. Um, hospitality, the raising up of the poor and the lowly and the low in status. Women were all of a sudden in the brigade and no longer on the outside. Um, uh, just everywhere he went, he brought life, undoing that social stigma, lifting up the lowly, as Mary called herself in the Magnificat in Luke 1. But the ways of the kingdom of heaven weren't just about salvation towards forgiveness. And yes, it is that, very much that. We've received God's forgiveness through Jesus. But we are entered into, through this bringer of life, a new order of life that we can go on at living. Redemption is this impartation of life for us to go on and live. Um, that we are brought back to life and we, in small ways, bring things back to life ourselves, things perhaps in our relationships, our relationship with him. Um, and this is the beginning and the opening of eternal life. Eternal life, yes, uh, to some degrees to do with life that goes on forever in terms of duration, but not just that, it's actually more about the quality of life. It's the qualitative nature of life that John is talking about in his gospel there. Um, if you read John 17, 3, it, what is eternal life? How is it defined? Dynamic, deep, profound relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's about a quality of relationship with God himself, a, a new vitality, an enhancement of life, everything in 3D, in color, great pungent smell and warmth of relationship, kinesthetic, holistic, wonderful. Um, do you know, faith, having faith in him, truly believing that he is real, knowing 
that he is real, living with him minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. You know, that brings a power and a and a, a, a vitality to our lives. Um, and all of this comes through when we interact with and, and become friends with and acknowledge the lordship of Jesus as the author of all life. And so the ways of the kingdom of heaven take us um, even further, even further um, in depth, because as we saw Jesus, who brought people back to life, the wee boy uh, and the processing funeral, he brought him back to life, the little girl who was already dead, and they mocked him for saying she's simply asleep. He rose her back to life. It is that hallmark of resurrection, true of, of overcoming even the last scourge, the deadliest enemy, the thing that stops every human being in their tracks, regardless, regard, regardless of creed, faith, culture, the problem of death. And in resurrection, we see the ultimate surprise. He isn't here, the angels said to Mary. He isn't here. Go and tell the guys that he has been risen from the God, has the author of life who you killed, Peter said to his fellow Jews, God has raised from the dead. Wow, what an exemplification of newness. The death is no more. He could not be held. The irony that the author of life was indeed killed by the Romans at the badgering of the Jewish religious leaders in order to pacify an unruly Jewish crowd so as to not have further revolt in this upstart of a land of Palestine. He comes back from the dead and he prepared the 12 for this, this author of life. He prepared them over and over. He reiterated it. Um, I love that line from the Graham Kendrick song, hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. But then the story doesn't end there bursting forth with life, a different kind of newness. The early church fathers used to call resurrection the eighth day of creation. It might sound a little bit odd to you, but what they were trying to convey with giving the seven days of creation a further day tacked on wasn't just a tacking on at all. This was something so radically new. It was another day of creation, new creation. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation because death has been overcome and this enhancement of life being written into his script um, really takes hold in the world afresh with every life uh, that acknowledges him, surrenders their lives to him. We park our autonomy away forever and we allow it to die a death in him. And he infuses us with his life, his vitality and vibrancy, um, where we're never the same again, this new order of life. And so not only did God raise Jesus from the dead, as our text in Acts 3.15 relates, it wasn't just the Father that raised the son from the dead, Jesus raised himself from the dead. He said already in John chapter 10, 18, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it up again. So the father raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus raised himself from the dead, but also the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, Paul writes in his letter. If the Spirit, meaning because he did, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the whole wonder of our triune God, the Godhead, uh, was involved in the raising of Jesus from the dead. You know, why am I trying to bring this up? I suppose, revisit this perspective of Jesus as the author of life to you today. Well, uh, because there are some things in creation, as it was very early doors in the creation story, that humans overreach the intent that God had for us in this creation. There is, there is the possibility of um, going a different way from the way he set out. God didn't say such and such, says the serpent. If you just take from that tree, you'll be like God. As if being God's image wasn't enough, the serpent pushes it further, says you'll be like God. Well, actually, we already are housed with God's image and likeness as men and women together, working together, living together in this creation, in this planet that he has given to us to steward, to rule and subdue. But we can overreach, overstretch the bounds of that relationship. And once again, that is being attempted uh, with a proposal to um, encourage assisted suicide, prematurely ending people's lives with medication, with the help of a doctor um, in our society. And this is one of the main takeaways I wish to bring to you today is to say, as a result of the scope of Jesus' life, his authorship, his creatorship, his sovereignty, all of it is his. He has given us a place. He has given us partnership with him. And yet, our Scottish Parliament will at some point this year, be dealing with a fresh assisted suicide, a third attempt to prematurely end the lives of those terminally ill. In the NHS, entirely legally. And we believe that this is another overreach. This is an overreach to say, we will determine when certain people die, rather than Jesus himself, the one who writes life into his script, the one who writes us out of the story and then writes new people in and every fresh generation is written in and older generations are written out. It is not our decision, our autonomous will to impose that on creation. It is his. He is the one that gives breath and takes it away. Book of Job, right? And so we want to corral you, Viewfield Baptist Church, to really consider vouching for those at the end of life who might feel burden, a burden to their family, a burden to the state that they might be taking up a hospice bed somewhere, a burden to NHS services when they are no burden at all. They still have the life in their lungs that Jesus has given them. And yet because of the suffering, and a very understandable suffering to wish to avoid, there are those in our parliament, Liam MacArthur, as you can see here, MSP for the Orkney Isles and deputy presiding officer who wish to prematurely end human lives. And you may say, well, actually he might have a decent point here because terminally ill folks are really struggling at the end of lives. And they are, they really are. There's no question of that. But this bill is based on a Canadian bill and other bills like it. And in each of the jurisdictions, the Netherlands, Belgium, the states of Oregon, New Jersey, and Washington and the United States, and now Canada, whenever bills have been passed, we we'll say these are only for the exception and not for the rule. Once the bill is passed in these narrow definitions, the barn doors are then blasted wide open. And assisted suicide is then offered to many others 
teenagers who are depressed, people struggling with other kinds of mental health. It becomes, in the Canadian law, discrimination to not allow assisted suicide for other difficult things and reasons in life. People become tired of life or are lonely or a little bit desperate. We want to vouch for people struggling to say, even though you are struggling, even though suffering is real, and we wish that weren't happening in their lives, in your life, we want to vouch for a protect the end of life because Jesus is its author, not us. We have overstretched, overreached our limits as human beings and are coming away, well away from his mastery, his lordship, acknowledgement of the fact that he is the one that gives us breath. So will you stand with us today? Will you get involved with Care for Scotland, learning how to speak to the Scottish Parliament well, with good tone, with good information by which you can convey some of these things? We would love you to be involved in that process with us, and we can help you do that for sure. We will leave you details um, by which you uh, QR codes by which you can sign up for those of you watching online um, and sign up for our prayer diary to get information either through your mailbox or in your inbox uh, to find a way of telling a better story in Scottish politics. We want to speak life into a place that wants to usher in premature death. Will you stand with us? Lord Jesus, we wonder at who you are. We bow down and get on our knees and on our dusty road or our flawless tarmac drive and say, you are Lord, get away from me. And yet you lift us up and say, I love you. I want to show you this is the way. This is how you live. And so allow us this week to take steps into the vibrancy of life. You who breathes and brings life and brings life back from the dead. We look forward to the day when you raise us up from being asleep in you and all things will be new, all suffering and tears will be gone. And until then, enable us to show glimpses and bring flashes of this life, maybe even more than that, to Dunfermline and Fife in our time, in our day, and in the power of your spirit, Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for being patient and uh, allowing me to share that with you this morning. I look forward to meeting some of you in person and perhaps hear from you uh, in my inbox and in other ways if you want to engage further with us at Care for Scotland. Uh, it's been a real pleasure and I hope to see you soon. Blessings.